regular causes for severity. As we well know, every Thursday, the government has created this platform to bring some of its officials to give the media or to give the Liberian people through using the media the lens. And so today there is absolutely no exception. We have inverted the Minister of Defense, where we ran a sound card, who will today be our key discussion. He will speak on issues of national security. Alongside with the Minister Samuka, will be Mr. George K. Wonder, Director General of the Civil Service Agency. He will update you on some of the development at his agency. We are expecting the Deputy Minister of uh, Health, Madam Ya Zuni, to greet us on the health financial plan of Nigeria. My understanding is that due to the strategic emission, uh, he's found a way to us. Uh, I hope that she follows the broadcast so and we will see her soon. But before I go to go on our discussion, I will let you observe our usual housekeeping detail. And I will begin with uh, the executive mansion. For excellence, President Ellen Johnson Sully, our leader, will on Sunday, September 8th, Depart the country on an official state visit to India. The visit will be characterized by intense bilateral talks between President Sali, our Indian counterpart, Pratna Muhammad. The Foreign Service Institute of the two countries in the areas of geology and mineral resources, in the field of oil and gas, in creating and establishing Liberia Indian Council on Agriculture and Education. She will discuss on the possible loan for the energy sector as part of India part billion dollar loan facility for developing countries. The agreement will be held in the area of education and health. Discussion will be held in the area of transportation for possible additional buses for public transport to the NTA. Our leader, President Sally, will address the business community meet with the Indian Chambers of Commerce and will encourage more Indian investors to come to Nigeria. She will also visit Jindal. A visit to Jindal, let me say, will be clearly in the direction of power. And it will have absolutely nothing to do with Ulubisi. During our leader of visit, she will also receive the Indira Gandhi Prize for Peace, Disarmament and Development. As you all know, the national legislature in the supreme interest of the state requested a two-week extension of their official break. Our leader, President Sally, has signed the proclamation endorsing the two-week extension of the National Day of Break. In line with the extension, the National Day Nation has amended its own rules that require them to meet 
twice a week. Today, I will speak, the National Legislature is meeting daily. And they are, during the session, they are discussing the issues of the national budget. They are talking about reform of the electoral laws, the dealing with the code of conduct, the decent welfare, among others. For these housekeeping, uh, I'd like to also just know these things happening in the present and then we have read Beverton uh, statement by the Liberian government on the reported use of chemical weapons in the Syrian crisis. The government of Liberia has reacted with consternation to the reported use of chemical weapons in the Syrian conflict. The use of chemical weapons in any conflict is prohibited on the Chemical Weapons Convention. And therefore, its use by any party in any conflict is a complete violation of international law, which will be party to openly condemn. The government of Nigeria therefore supports the current mission of the United Nations team investigating the reported use of chemical weapons in the Syrian crisis. The Covenant Party or parties in the perpetration of this India's crime against the Syrian people must not go with impunity. They must be held fully accountable by the international community. With these small housekeeping details, let me now take this down very quickly uh, to invite our first uh, discussion, Mr. John K. Umana. The Director General of the Civil Service Agency, who will just give us updates of some of the happenings at his, at his agency. Uh, following a presentation, if uh, uh, Zulia is not here yet, then we will have our key discussion, who will discuss with you issues of critical and national security in nature. Again, thank you. Pleasure to be here with you. Um, thanks to the Ministry of Information for the invitation, and um, I recognize the presence of the media here. And what I would like to do is to give you an update on what the government of Liberia has been doing to modernize the public sector. So I. So, uh, without, without further ado, what I would like to demonstrate here is, you see over there, the public sector modernization reform. Uh, let me just state from the onset that in the government of Liberia, there are three um, institutions that lead the public sector modernization reform. Um, the Governance Commission, um, the Library Institute for Public Administration, NIPA, and then the Civil Service Agency. Uh, if you ask, uh, simply put, uh, the institutions in government need them for themselves job descriptions in terms of their mandate and functions. Part of what the Governance Commission does is to provide that job descriptions for institutions. LIPA is charged with training people who work for those institutions. And then the Civil Service Agency is in charge of recruitment, benefits, and building capacity 
within the civil service. So all three institutions work together to make sure that government is, is fully capacitated to carry on the work it has to do. Um, Okay, so what we have then seen is this. Within the reform process, we're asking ourselves the question, why the public sector reform and why now? As you know, we just celebrated 10 years of interrupted peace. And we say government needs to reform the civil service to advance development and to sustain the peace. And in the course of this conversation, I will tell you why. We situate our conversation within the context of the Agenda for Transformation, which says that you have to give people better incentives to perform well. Additionally, we who manage government, we have to improve our abilities to be able to develop services for the people. You want a civil service that is based on merit, that librarians will be able to compete Get their jobs available in a merit-based recruitment process. You also want to increase transparency and accountability across government. So what is the state of the civil service as we know it now? Uh, we've done many good things. And the civil service is stronger than it has ever been. At the same time, we have hurt deeply by low capacity and productivity. Uh, we can see that in any given ministry or agency, we have shortage of skills and talent, and people are not compensated enough to be well motivated to do the things they have to do. The records we get, the civil service agency receives from the various ministries indicate that a lot of people don't go to work, and yet they line up every pay period to get paychecks. So as a result, you'll have a wage bill that is growing, eating into the national budget. This is unsustainable. And you also have an issue of people who cannot be accounted for on the wage bill. Uh, on, yes, on the wage bill, we call those people, uh, most workers, and I call some of them those salaries. And then we have issues with people who are, quote unquote, employed, but there are no jobs for them to do. They dress well, they go to work, but there's no work for them to do so. You have an issue of redundant workers. And then the way we compensate people go into our history. Three ways, the librarian dollar, the special allowance, and the general allowance. It can be confusing to a lot of people and to many in the civil service or public service. The way we compensate people is unjust, it is unfair, it's causing a lot of anger in people, so government has a bad on changing that. So, what is happening in the wage bill is this. When the government began, say, around 2008 or so, we were operating around, say, $3 million. Right now, we're operating around, what, $210 million. That means, the good news is, the economy is growing and we're getting more than everything we need to be able to pay people. But if you have a $500 billion national budget and your wage bill is around 36% of the budget, there's something wrong with that. Something is wrong because for you to be able to finance your wage bill, 
it must be below 35, 35%. We are not going to violate what is a trend to be to continue to work. If we are to do the things we want to do, build roads, build ports, provide employment for our people in the private sector. So that is what we are demonstrating over there. The economy is growing, but we need to control the wage bill so that it doesn't continue to eat into the national budget. So, what is the approach for the public sector modernization reform? We are advancing three key things. The first is this. I mean, government does not really have the right size. Look at what it does. The size of any government depends on the needs of that government at a given particular time. So what we need to have is to optimize the size of the Liberian government so that it can deliver the services it has to deliver in a quality way. And that also means removing those needs and redundant workers. The second part to consider is this. As I said earlier, we need to restructure compensation. So you, some people started working 20 years ago. If you're driving a person working 20 years ago, in this current day structure we have, you are making the seat as a driver who sat in yesterday. That is wrong. You need to have a pay system that has grades so people can advance along the pay structure. The other thing is you have to have a sound methodology for people who retire so that they can get their pensions, good pensions to make their rest, the rest of their lives well. You also have people who may not be given in government for whatever reason. Uh, you have to have a way to get them out of government into the private sector and in such a way that they can add to the economy. The last part we want to look at is how best professional, uh, the, uh, professionalize the civil service. We have to institute a reform that manages the civil service in the professional way. So, in our belief, we had a window of opportunity yesterday. The cabinet was very engaged and had a very fruitful conversation about the public sector reforms. The vice president was present and, and gave an excellent support to the reform. So, we have a legislature. There was a hearing on in terms of restructuring institutions yesterday that went very well. And then you have the judiciary. And it's also in the process of reforming itself. You have our partners, the government partners, who are willing to help us fund our reform process if we take the right steps. Uh, and then you have the public that is anxious for results. People want better pay, people want government to be uh, transparent in its recruitment levels. So we have the support that we need. Over the past, uh, over the past six for seven years, we built capacity enough to be assured that my parents themselves can drive this, and we think that we are ready to move. So let me give you some milestones we have reached as a government. So. What is the evidence? Sometimes you in the press we hear people about, uh, some people say, all right, let's see what the government has done incrementally to help civil servants get better salaries. I gave you the evidence since 2006, what has happened. It is not enough, but at least you see some progress being made in terms of our government. The least paid civil servant now makes hundred and twenty-five US dollars. That's the business so compared to fifteen US dollars, the equivalent of fifty US dollars in two thousand and six. And you, you see teachers there. If you are a master's level teacher, you should make at least five hundred US dollars per month. Master's level teachers. And all the other teachers that have been certificated have their own pay grade structures. There's also uh, before there on questions about payroll planning. You see what was done in 2008, you see what is being done now, we are in 2013. There are letters going out to ministries to instruct them about the final payroll campaign. What has happened is 
As a result of the various training exercises, a lot of money has been saved, and where has that money gone? It's increased civil servant, civil servant salaries, it's gone into development, but here's something else that is eating into government money. The civil service pension system is not contributory, meaning nobody takes money from your paycheck to put in your pensions in the civil service system. So when somebody retires, it's like a welfare check government gains. You don't get into it. But the savings is financing the pensions like that. The pensions is not enough, but I just want you to know where the money goes. What we have done in terms of improving systems for accountability, for transparency, to curb corruption. If you can look there, you can see that we have the public financial management system under the Ministry of Finance. We also have the integrated financial management information system. We have the biometrics, we have human resource systems, and we have the civil service management systems. These are systems that are automated now to pay government workers. So if somebody is not paid well, or if somebody is in the wrong category, these systems will, will catch that. That's how we're catching those workers or people who say, for example, um, I should have gotten this, I didn't get it. Why? I have a situation now, uh, we took over the payroll system from the Minister of Finance, for example, about two months ago now. And as a result of the civil service management system, we're catching some things. Some people in the same grade, say drivers, some drivers were making more than others in the A salary, which is about million dollars. We haven't put in grades yet, so that is not supposed to happen. The computers cut it. And across the board, the computers were able to correct that. Sometimes we think about putting in these systems, and we can talk about corruption all we want. It's a good thing. But the thing about putting these systems is they can make you to become the victim of your own success. You show people systems and you know now what the system can do to support those issues so that everybody becomes aware when there is a mistake or somebody is trying to go around the system. The other thing I wanted to tell you is the biological scholarship program is training or has trained around 400 people. The various programs we have, the president's young professional program, some of the young people, some here at the Ministry of Information, has graduated from the four people. The top 10 program has had more than 100 beneficiaries. I am one of them. And then you have the senior executive program that has more than 150 people benefiting from it. The financial management training program and the procurement training program has about what, 120 people. And the ethical leadership program on the JICA has trained over 40 people. So government is working to build capacity to drive this thing forward. The good news I want to report to you is this. We need the help of the media to educate our people about these reforms. We need better salaries for the civil service, but we have some hard choices to make. You cannot hate corruption and at the same time support somebody who is not working in government getting a huge salary. You just dress well and will work or do nothing for government. We have to spot these people and get them out so that those who work can get better pay. Thank you. I tell you. Can you let me just talk about the See, the Lord knows that. Well, it's not a deep hit on the well-established for like today. The reason being that uh, the Minister of Defense has some very serious pressing national matters in the team. And because of that, he asked us and care about the presentation, take some questions, and then go to the official team and have the team of the And so on. Uh, so he reported to the Prime Minister about the presentation. Let me see if I can make a meeting with Steve and then I'll phone you and I'll show you my concern. One of us is not standing before the microphone. I mean, it's a brand this morning as well. As well. As I think we need to change that. Not to see it. Not to see it. That. 
And so we ask him to hurry to stand in his church. That's what he's like to me. So we just let me go on a very eloquent and minister, somebody who knowledge of the security sector remains quite on the ground. This is the information on the deployment of the EFL in the Minosma mission in uh, Mali. Apparently, I uh, provide very information on those recruits, potential recruits that are waiting for recruiting and training in the armed forces of Liberia. And then I will briefly talk on uh, my, uh, my uh, issue, issue involving, involving the helicopter recording. Let me say briefly that since the uh, deployment of the EFL to Bamako, our platoon have been conducting uh, themselves very, very professionally. They were rehabbed, but you know, uh, dealing with the human people that we took for a few months in Israel. And uh, they are presently uh, deployed on location. Uh, Probably about 300 kilometers away from Tamako. The paper I told you, in the other day. The government was providing them with um, basic transportation while we were going. The US government was very kind enough to provide aircraft to our troops and also providing them with uh, some other logistical support. And we hope in that will be expected while they are there. The Ministry of Defense also ordered for policy uh, level six uh, protection for our troops. And those equipment are coming out of New Zealand and they should be going into Namako very shortly. We will enhance the physical protection of our soldiers and officers and into in the event of any need for engagement. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Given the kind of work that the EF has been doing in Mali, and the confidential reports in them, the United Nations provided them with additional vehicles, three to two tank vehicles, uh, for the EFI for their use in their mission area. We were in bed with the Nigerian battalion that I'm sure all of you are not aware have been drawn uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, in the next coming days, the company size troops from Togo, about 165 troops from Togo, will be joining our Liberian AFL personnel that are out there in our tour. That will beef up the ongoing operations. Uh, just a couple of days ago, two days ago, three days ago, as a matter of fact, the AFL out there in Bamako was tasked with the duty of protecting some human rights personnel who have come out there, <laughs> and human rights lawyers who have come out there uh, in Mali, and we provide some protection for them in such a very dangerous environment. And I can tell you the mission was successful. The government of my area continued to provide for the feeding and support of our troops, and that feeding and support is simply complementing what the United Nations mission 
is already going to be a part of our troops that are deployed in the middle of my prison area. Um, the beginning of this month or today to be assigned may take about seven to six days in the deployment of my airport troops. And I can tell you through that deployment, there has been no incident in their operations. They have conducted themselves with utmost discipline, professionalism, and they continue to raise the library flag with pride and dignity. We continue to trust and believe in our ability. And so we want to thank the Nigerians uh, who provided the needful support for our troops when they were individually embedded with the Nigerian continent. Um, as I speak to you, we are personnel leading from Liberia. In the next day or two, I'll be sending two personnel out to Mali to take additional supplies for our troops and our household. And for those days that are wondering whether we have been uh, given uh, any financial support, I can tell you we have not received any financial support thus far by the UN in that mission area. Having said that, the UN is going through its normal process of deployment and definitely that administrative aspect will be definitely double in due course. In the meantime, the Minister of National Defense on a monthly basis has been and we have provided financial support through funding provided for by the Commander in Chief and we have been able to send those to our troops. And that does not affect whatever benefits or whatever salary or whatever payment the UN is going to provide for our troops uh, while they are deployed. Although initially we have talked about a three to six month deployment by the the United Nations rules, the initial deployment period is of one year. So they are expected to remain out there for one year. And hopefully we can have rotation uh, sometime in the middle part of next, next year. Um, so pretty much with regards to the deployment of our troops, that is the updated information I wanted to provide you on that, uh, on that particular one. In the past couple of days, two days ago, we had the fourth quadrupartite meeting between Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire in the two UN missions. As a way of buttressing and focusing the two countries on enhancing security along the common movement, and at the same time building confidence in the population along those areas. You may recall that the first meeting took place in August of 2012 um, in La Côte in which the Ministry of Defense and Force of Liberia, as well as the Ivorian military and security personnel, and the, U the two UN missions of UNMIL and UNICEF. Participated. And the intention was to review the border situation that was evolving, to improve security, and to provide confidence for the local population in those two areas. The second meeting took place in March of this year, and then we just followed by another quadrupartite time meeting in uh, June, and finally the fourth meeting we took place yesterday, we were signed communicate. And so some of you heard on the radio that uh, there were not too certain as to whether a community was signed because somebody, according to the reporter, was running behind somebody with paper who was going to rob a seat. All of that I have there for you. The evidence to show that, in fact, the document is signed. So for those of you who would like to see it, I can show you signatures of all of the documentation that are in place on it. Um, that agreement provides for uh, two levels of uh, joint controls and joint operations. One is this year, and then the second is going to be next year. You may recall the Operation Restore Hope was the title of the operation in which the government of Liberia ordered the deployment of the AFL on June 10th uh, of 2012 with the combined forces from the, um, the tactical capabilities of the Liberia National Police as well as the capabilities of the Bureau of Innovation and the other security elements. That deployment left an enhancement of security along our two borders, given the fragility of the situation. And all of you are evidence to the fact that the security conditions along the border have sent significantly improved, thereby diminishing the level of concerns that people had initially. So there is no incident that is anticipated at this point in time. However, our intention between the two countries and the two UN missions is to continue 
and then took the city of Robin to improve the environment for continuous trade across our borders, the, for continuous communication between two nations and two peoples, and at the same time to test the interoperability of the Mario region and the fifth protocol of contrary to the Mario region, and the So that will be the next couple of weeks, we'll see a movement of tactical movement by our foot of my bureau towards the Liberia uh, border, the border with the Southeast and Northeastern Belt. And, and at the same time, I'll be joined by the technical elements of the Liberia Mountain and the Bureau of Immigration as part of the Joint Task Force in carrying out this joint operation. We'll also conduct river mine operation on the Kabbalah River to, um, to beef up security along the river and at the same time improve the, uh, the coordination of, of operation between two countries on the on the Kabbalah on the Kabbala River. The two ministers of defense at the same time in and, and, and Liberia continue to maintain and end the relationship uh, in a way that it help to reduce any level of suspicion to have a common hand line in which we speak to about each other on a very regular basis. And hopefully uh, the continuation of this for double time meeting We'll continue to follow that as the UN yet into this transition process. Quickly, let me just say a bit on the transition process that is ongoing. That project is ongoing. The first phase of the transition has pretty much uh, concluded successfully. Uh, with the United Nations uh, training over to the government of Liberia, various tasks that have been performing and various facilities that they conducted themselves. The western sector in Cape Mount all the way towards Lofa County and other areas like the southeast including the river in the Ghana and the water. So you continue to see uh, a reconsolidation of the UN forces and at the same time the government by like, taking over those responsibilities to start to end the transition process. The second phase of the transition process is beginning in which the notification is being done to the government by the UN on a 90-day basis, 60-day basis, 120 day basis so that the government can get prepared to assume those responsibilities. And based upon our own assessment, since the transition of the UN and those facilities, the security condition has not, and I repeat, has not deteriorated. As a matter of fact, the even bank is stable. So we are very confident that this continuation of capacity building in our military and our bureau security sectors, including the police and immigration and other security services will buttress our own efforts to take care of our own security as the transition process continues. This process continues um, most likely as an indicator up to about 2015-2016. But there's a continuous pressure of the United Nations, there's a continuous beef up of the former police leader by the UN who bring their appreciate back. We'd like to express our thanks. All of these things cause um, have financial implications and these are being worked out to the normal budgetary process. It is hopeful that um, I will say that we will begin to see how over the years, over a certain year period, the government of Nigeria has continued to build the capacities of both the police, immigration, security services, as well as the armed forces of, um, of Liberia. Let me also now come on to those who, um, who have intended to join the armed forces of Liberia, one of the status of the recruitment process. You may recall that over 4,000 plus Liberians uh, in the country, uh, the very short notice, uh, tried to compete for about 340 slots that we had. And out of the four, uh, out of the 4,000 persons that uh, competed, uh, less than 25% uh, were able to meet the initial bidding process. That is about 900 of their about personnel successfully had the first, second, and third phases. First and second phases, we are now in the third phase of the public vetting of these individuals and all of their names have been posted around the country, different communities, <clears throat> for the public to buy in, in a very process, any information you have. It's a non-judicial process, which means we will not prosecute any individual for whom we have any kind of derogatory information, rather we use the information only for internal purposes to make a determination of who will become a successful recruit. So the general question of board have seen the initial information, the final information has been provided and the board will be meeting Chadley to finally make the final selection process um, of the 340 potential recruits out of which only 200, I repeat, 220, 
220 persons will finally be selected. That is how strange the vetting process is in order to join a new armed forces of Liberia. Now let me state to you something about vetting. Those who do not meet the vetting process doesn't mean you fail. There's something called the order of merit. The order of merit means that only the best of the best will reach the number. Say, for an example, we need only about uh, 340 persons and 4,000 persons took, took the uh, took the initial steps to get in. We go through a different kind of diagnostic process, be it physical examination, medical examination, uh, diagnostic testing, interview process, the own physical ability. So all of these have to be elimination process so we become more objective for the determine. And then we'll come to the second phase of the building process. We then go we'll come to the order of merit list that then the highest score from the highest score to the lowest. If we were looking for the highest score, the highest score happens to be 95, for example. And then the first 195, we will take the first 100. And then the second 100, uh, the second 194, we will take the second 100, we'll take the second 100, we'll take the second 100, It doesn't mean that people who made 93, 92, 91 fail. It should not mean that the vetting process is going to cause the vetting list. So there is no human intervention in that process. And if the Minister of Defense cannot help you, the question of the Minister of Defense cannot help you, no politician can help you, nobody can help you to pass. You, as a potential recruit, has to help yourself. So that's what has happened. So it doesn't mean that people fail. It simply means on the order of merit, uh, that's where the line has been drawn. And I think it's very important uh, for me to share that, uh, share that information. With you. And I also then like to, to make the following statement for the record. And what I choose to say now is actually on my own volition, is what I believe in. I honestly believe what I'm about to say. And I think it's extremely important for everyone listening to understand that I have thought about what I've done, I have thought about everything that has happened, and I think it's very important that I reflect on it and take my own decision. And the teacher I have taken reflects clearly what I believe my upbringing has come up to me. Growing up in my home, getting uh, my religious education, whether it's uh, mechanic schools, or whether it's in the monastery of Bola Home, or whether it's down here in the river Zion and elsewhere, and all of those that I've met along the way have taught me a lot of things in the process. And as a normal human being, when I recognize that my own sort of African person has come to the public domain, it is incumbent upon me to take on that responsibility. First, I want to tell you that I take full responsibility for what you heard, although it is greatly edited, but I choose not to go into that version. I take full responsibility for granting the kind of access that uh, any custom had to me. I gave her the opportunity to do the recording that she did. I have many friends who come to visit. If we begin to apply stringent security measures for all of our friends, we're going to stretch such each and every one, including journalists who come to visit. I think it will surpass our own intention of our openness and kind of society that we have. We meet friends and we discuss the friends. Gossip has been a part of life. Sometimes the gossip comes out very not very good, but it has always been a part of life. And gossip means you hate it. But at the time and the moment of those discussions, those issues come about. Here's not an excuse I'm trying to find. I'm just trying to tell you, as a person, that if you believe that you are involved in trade or gossiping, then I wish you well in everything that you choose to do. So let me say to you, I wish to offer my deep and heartfelt apologies for the bad memory work of course. To so my chief, the uh, Madam Ellie Johnson, so the president, and to some of my colleagues, and my sister, as a this year. Indeed, those words are inappropriate. In some cases, the friends, as a colleague, I shouldn't be talking like that. I've worked with them over the years, and I know that. I offer my apology for that. My conversation with Mr. Scott and Mr. Daniel Cochran did not and does not reflect the integrity of all the efforts of this government in bringing sanity and dignity to our nations. I accept responsibility for what I said, and my words are undying. And the rapid culture resulted in the distraction from the focus of our national agenda and our agenda for, uh, agenda for transformation. For this, Madam President, I'm deeply sorry. 
And to my countrymen, I want to reassure you that I remain committed and loyal in serving our common patriotism. After 35 years of public service, I hold no better pride of coming out to serve my country with pride in the In the service that I've written, I've never been accused and convicted of any criminal act. Neither have I been convicted of any act of impropriety in government, in the private sector, as well as in the United Nations where I work. It is a human error to which I accept full responsibility. And I say to you too, Madam President, that indeed I have come with a renewed vigor to continue the work, to remain loyal to our country, and working and moving forward with the development agenda, and at the same time continue to seek your wisdom and guidance in fostering our mutual trust and confidence that you always had in me. And I want to tell our people out there that I stand committed to ensure that whatever short time that I have to serve as Minister of Defense, whatever time that I have to have served as Minister of Defense, I've served with my honest self and everything about myself that have brought me to this public level of public service. I want to tell you as colleagues and friends, I say I have confidence in all my friends, Everything that I did to help friends, I stand by it. Everything that I said to you who come to visit me, the only thing that I said to you, I actually made it from the bottom of my heart. If you felt insulted by that, I sent to you my apology. But I want to say I will not draw back from the fact that we should have friends and be able to talk in private. I will not draw back from the fact that I should be restricted from talking to my friends. I will not draw back from the fact that I'm a part of human society. I will not draw back on the fact that I also am a human. I'm not a born with real question. I can make mistakes. But if I make mistakes in the context of that, then I recognize it, I accept full responsibility. And let us not use my, 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 my discussion, my conversation that I had in that interview, to distract us from the national agenda this government is trying to pursue. Let us not be distracted by the merits of the case that the government of as indicated by the Minister of Justice yesterday and the Solicitor General. As a person, I have done my part and I've accepted my responsibilities and I'm prepared to accept the repercussion of that. Those who think that they have been accused today, those who believe that they, are not, they, they, they did nothing wrong, let them come and face justice. Let them come and recuse themselves out of the issue. Let them come and show that in fact the, cause, that, that, that the issue upon which they have been brought upon that indictment that he can exonerate themselves to due process of law. Let us not use the public domain and the media and, the, and everything else to release the issue of private conversation as a way of distracting from the merits of the case that have been brought. So I just wanted to make that very clear to some of our colleagues. Finally, there have been many rumors spread as to how the division of the Defense is going to go I want to set the record straight. I met Eddie Parker only at Harvard University about two years ago when I was attending the seminar at the at Harvard University. And that was where I met her. I met two common friends. I met two other colleagues who were also there at Harvard University. There's another librarian who wanted to come back home. Another librarian who had pushed and said she wanted to come back to serve the country. Someone with, with a record that was very impressive on paper. I must tell you that. If anyone of you have seen that document as a record that on paper, you would be that very impressed. That is what I did as a librarian. Trying to help another colleague in the diaspora who wanted to come back home to come and serve. That's all I need. But in granting that access, in granting that opportunity to that individual, see the decision advantage you have taken. What do you think an action I've done now? If anyone were to come back from the diaspora and come to any one of you today, and one will have a conversation with you to help them, to take them to the power that you have, to please lose them to the rest of my life, would you be willing to risk yourself to do that? That is what it's called. It's not just for me, it's also to you and to yourself and those who are out there. I hear people saying the Minister compromised national security. <laughs> what is the national security Minister compromise? You listen to the first tip, you listen to the second tip. Those recordings were made when I met her, I came from La Côte d'Ivoire, and I met her and we met at every restaurant. In a normal conversation, I made some comments, like I said, were inappropriate. We followed that because I had to come to me, she followed me as the Minister of Defense. And if you listen to the recording, she was recording even while she was sitting. And because she was using the remote recorded device, the device in the vehicle while her colleague was sitting in the car, operating the vehicle, operating the equipment while she had a microphone on. Any one of you sitting here with a consumed device. 
that go to visit a friend. How would you know? Are you telling me we need to strip search everybody who come to visit us? Even if you leave your telephone outside? So I just want you to understand, yes, today is some kind. Some kind of accept the responsibility. But understand that you put yourself in a situation that I have found myself. What will we do next? So if anyone can come to visit me in my private domain, in my official domain, what should I do? Should I not trust that you come to me honestly? Should I still search you before we even converse? So I just want to say once again, fellow librarians, my years of service, I am sure everything has to come to an end, one way or the other. And I think after 35 years, it's getting very close. We will have to begin to think on how to prepare the next generation of people sooner than later to, go, to take over from some of us. I have served for seven years as Minister of Defense. Many capacities in the country we have served. As Deputy Minister of Defense for Operation, in one of the most difficult periods of our nation history. As Director of Police, when this phase was chaos. As Deputy Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, in the midst of faction leaders, fleeing into exile. Working for the United Nations, resigning and coming back home to work. I think I've done my part. Whatever the future holds, I will leave with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. We go back to the presiding uh, officer. We we'll make a brief remarks and then we move on. I mean, there is, there is absolutely no topic in the form, but sometimes when you get moved by the eloquence of the speaker, you can enjoy that liberty. As I indicated earlier, the minister has really asked that he has some very pressing engagement. And because of that, we will encourage you to direct your question to the minister. After he answers your question, we will ask him to leave and then we will continue with the conference. After the question from the minister, we will listen to Madam Zuni, the deputy minister of health. But the minister has said in very clear and simple language. That to err is human, to forgive is not mine. He asks all of us to join him. And I want to know and want to see who will impute the justice in this matter. The issues of talking things on the sidelines that are not efficient, who will resonate with all of us as human beings. We have made that case. And I show we we'll all go by the maxim established in the Bible. To forgive as divine. He asks the forgiveness of his colleagues, and apologize for accident to the president. And I think these are the most of the time. We are taking the strength to do so. We encourage you to direct your question to the Minister of the Lord. There are other members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Before the questions, we'd like to read out our numbers for those who are here. If you'd like to make a or you can call the people, triple seven, forty-five, and the seven, forty-three. Once again, zero seven 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 four five seven four three. Once again, zero seven 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 four five eight seven four three. Once again, zero seven 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 four five eight seven four three. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, we ask that you please be audible on the radio. This is not your official place. You come here, we give you instructions, and you revive our instructions. We ask you to call your name. You ask one question 
Did the institution want to work with this? And then ask the question. Thank you. So, my name is Sam Zulta Junior, and I write for the news newspaper. You earlier said that you meant everything you said. And I will capture on the tip. At the same time, apologizing for those things that you meant and you said about your colleagues and the president. How do you compromise the apology and then your statement that you meant everything you said? Thank you, the minister. We will take two additional questions and then you we'll respond. Good morning, my name is uh, Trojan Ajazu from Fiber. Um, Mr. Minister, um, in the recording with Enko, I'm sure you did it because she was your friend and all of that. I don't know whether you say friends. But tell us, how far or what are your intentions? Because according to the Justice Minister yesterday, it is that the ADB must be uh, to carry that case further, probably to court or what have you. What are your intentions? Are you intending to take my co to the court um, because she ordered her exonerate or something? I've heard attention from the indictment against her. She recorded you secretly. So are you going to take her to the court? Thank you. Do we have the final question for this one? Welcome to the news. I'm Bruno Nabra of Congo Times. Why was the first thing I went to your mom when you see a tip from your friend? Thank you. Mr. Samukan will respond and we get the final batch of questions and then respond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on your first question with regards to that I said I meant everything, it's an integrity issue. You don't make a statement and you come back and you start pretending that you didn't mean it. Right? That was with the context of the discussion. But I think let us refocus on what I said. I said I have heard. I said I have a separate responsibility. I will apologize to my boss, I will apologize to my colleagues. I said, let, us, let us see it as that. That's what I've done. That I will accept. If you are not a man of strong enough or some of the self responsibility publicly for your action, I am. It's an integrity issue. When you make a statement, you say, yes, I did. And if you're wrong, you accept the fact that you're wrong. You bear the consequences for that. That's my upbringing. And I think it has led to my sources over the years. So I don't shy away from things that I say. I respect all my friends, I respect my colleagues. I'll just open to you. Many of you have seen, many of you have visited me, some of you have gossip about other people to me. I've heard you clearly. But I don't think that is the issue. It's like just a normal course of life. But if you make a mistake in the process, yes, you come and apologize for it and then move on with your life. And I can tell you quite frankly, uh, what are my intentions with regards to the recording? None myself. I've come out, I've said what I have to say. Let them live with their conscience. There's a merit of a case, let them follow the case, the merit of a case. Not my priority name. What is the first thing about mine? Let us not try to affect the size of this issue. Let us not do that. Let us not try to make the issue or you like a, a, a big reporting issue. That is not a big reporting issue. Let us not try to fantasize the issue as to how I felt. Whatever I told you my son will will upset. What does that mean? Or what if I tell you say what I've done in news, I felt like I should eat some more food. It doesn't help. That was not fantasize. That's a very serious issue here that we need to address ourselves. Stop selling the newspaper with my name headline and my picture and recording. <laughs> because some papers can sell. There are some very credible papers that are writing very decent issues. They're challenging issues, critical issues. So let's not fantasize the issues. Yes, I have a certain responsibility. I didn't take no cato on the table. Nobody in our call discussing money. Yeah, nobody saw me discussing money issue. Nobody saw me discussing contracts. Nobody heard me trying to, to defraud the government by era. I just want to make those points. Thank you. Thank you very much. We did the final batch of questions. My name is Minister. I'm the other and I write for the analyst newspaper. Uh, as it relates to the allegations you made against you on pressure of security, you as an experienced uh, person, don't you think that there should be a boundary between your private life and the public function that you will secretly require on the Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right, please come forward. If you like back, you have to ask this one. After this, we need to get another question. Um, good morning, uh, Minister. I'm Kevin Deming, and I report for five minutes. 
Uh, there were reports that the deputy chief of staff appeared in front of the Senate for confirmation, and uh, there are reports that he was put on hold, and, and I'm also hearing that uh, he been commissioned in the EFL as deputy chief of staff. We care to talk about that. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Uh, thank you, Madam Minister. My name is Justice Black, and I'm from On the Radio. Well, uh, you said two things. Uh, that you accept, you accept, rather, anything that a teacher you know, might bring in regard to this assertion. Does that mean actually you're ready to resign anytime, or are you ready to relinquish the post of whoever? Thank you. In the final? Yeah. Okay, we'll just let the two of you then we close in. Perhaps my be a follow-up to justice. My name is Francis Pillay, I'm from Sky TV and Sky FM. Uh, you refer to that conversation as an ordinary gossip, but that may have far reaching effect, especially with your colleagues and your boss, to whom you have already apologized. But do you think you will still commend uh, that trust and respect? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Martin Johnson. I'm from Power TV. Mr. Minister, can you please clarify that you've tendered your resignation? Number two, were you fully aware that Mama Popo was an American citizen? If that is correct, don't you think that was a disservice to this country by bringing an American citizen in the world? Thank you. We close all the questions for your inside defense. We will take his uh, interview his response and then we go back to the Thank you so much. Um, let me let me talk about security breach, boundary of personal and private. Show me where the security breach. I talked to somebody. Where the breach of security? Did I disclose national security information? Did I provide a disposition of our weapons? The disposition of our various scenarios and strategy and a range of options of responding to national security issues. Did I discuss that? Stop. I did not. I said it was a personal conversation. I said responsibility for that. That's what I said. So come in. Um, somebody asked a question, uh, what are you going to resign? I've just spoken that I did. All of us are librarians who understand me. Very clear. I spoke. You heard me. From the beginning to the end. If I was, I'm going to make a statement right now. Very clear what I'm saying. Not only that, I am a migrant with qualification. I'm not just somebody who don't have. Taxpayers send me to school. Taxpayers. My mother sent me to school. My father sent me to school. Sister Evelyn told me. Sister Susan told me. Teacher Clark told me. Teacher Carver told me. I went on a reputable people. From the Ministry of Labor, where I served as a clerk in the Bureau of Statistics, under the name of PNS Boy, then to the Bureau of Vocational Affairs, by the page, and then on our Charles Collins, on a day later on. So let me tell you. So that's not an issue of resigning and eating at all. So let us not look at that. I want to make it very clear. When you tomorrow get into public service, you will face the public the same way. So I am sitting here and facing you, so I'm responding to your questions. I want to clear certain things from your mind. Very clear, Carl. Very clear. I took my time and I learned from people. I didn't worry about bringing them in different names and different, qual and different qualifications. I did not. I learned. I appreciated. I was mentored by them. I was brought up by them. But I can call their names today. You talk about loading your faith and saying something, go and, go and see George Thompson. She's here. George Williams Thompson. One of the best minds. She taught me integrity easy. How to say it as it is. They mean exactly what I say. 
You go to my trial's grave, you will see the inscription. If you don't hear, you will feel it. <laughs> and our father thought of that. And for me, you can ask my colleagues. I accept no excuse. Watch them. I rather tell people I accept responsibility. So the issue of resignation is not an issue. I don't think you should be worried about it when I resign or I don't resign. <laughs> On the issue of um, about trust and respect. You heard me in my last statement in which I spoke to you as Nigerian people, I spoke to your colleagues, I spoke to my colleagues, and I spoke to my boss. I crave their wisdom. And I as I as I'm very hurt. But it doesn't question my integrity and my performance. Now if you tell me I didn't know my job, yes. If you say standing out there, you had a bomb approach, well, then good luck to you. If you have made no mistakes in your life, it's fine with you. But I have, and I've been taught to learn to accept responsibility. And I am so happy because when I look at where my bureau was many years ago, I see where it is today, and I see the potential of tomorrow of this country opening up. I am very glad and very thankful that I'm able to work for my own president, Eddie Johnson, at this time. I'm very glad and very thankful that we have the kind of leadership that we have, the level of tolerance that it brings, the wisdom it impacts, the patience we should learn. And the energy we can exert in moving this country forward, I'm very glad I was able to work on our leadership. Very, very, very glad. And I have a deep appreciation and deep trust for our wisdom. No doubt, absolutely in my mind, I say properly. When I'm in, when I'm out, I give her full respect at all times. Looking at where this country can go. Looking at where many of you seven years ago didn't know the direction you were going to be heading in your life. Many of you were just coming out of the war with high school papers. Today, you got your bachelor's, you went in your master's. Today, some of you are not journalists. Today, you're journalists and you can write whatever you choose to write. Yes. No one calling you to resign. <laughs> So, you know, I think on that note, there's uh, <laughs> an essential influence from here. And, um, you know, let me say, look, if you and I, you and I were born in uh, Ibedu. We went to ball play. We knew you from there. You came from here. You came to Madruga. You left from here. You went to where you met our people. That means you went to your home. And you learn your education, you come back, and you go to a village and say, oh, you are not here like you. When you're looking for legal semantics, I'm not going to get involved in that. I'm on that. If I am born in Ubedi, and I come to Foya, I go to white people, please, I go to America. I got my education and come back. He said, because I went there and there was uh, there was no way for me to live unless I, I have a legal status. And I got one and came back. And you said, because I got legal status, to live legally in somebody else's country. You come back, you look at me and you say, but well, you're not for Bobby. Or you're not for Foley. Well, legally, you might be right, because that's what the Constitution says. They, they become a constitutional issue. But as friends, we don't put that boundary. We don't. We don't talk to friends, we talk to colleagues. And that's what it is. Tomorrow, you might be fortunate to leave this country and acquire knowledge and education and training. And an opportunity will come your way. 
If it does come your way, make the best decision. For yourself, for your children in the future, and your country in the future. That's why I can tell you what I said at this. As I close, let me thank the listening audience. Thank my mother. Very supportive of me. She came from Lima County, very safe. Still with me through all the process. I thank my wife, who is here, who has been very supportive in the very difficult times. I thank all my children, who, wherever they are, wherever they were, have been calling to give me moral support. I thank my colleagues in the Ministry of Defense, the Deputy Assistant, and all the staff, the leadership, for believing in my integrity. And to thank my friends in the media. Many of you out there were very critical of me. I was not thankful you were because I was your friend. That's why you critical of me. For me, you might not make that kind of mistake. And I appreciate that. I'm very thankful for that. And to thank all of those who made it possible for me to be able to stand and look you in the face and speak as I do. And to thank Madam President for understanding this matter and for even believing in my ability, my intelligence, that she ordered me to go to New York to represent my bureau at the UN where transition process being discussed. The other day some other said the president came and they never said Bernie Sanders had the headline news. <laughs> but the same people that reported the story did not say how the Madame called me publicly for about 20 minutes of discussion. They didn't report at the same time that when she went in the car publicly again, she said for me. And we have further discussion. They didn't say that. They didn't write the good things. They try to make it appear I'm the boogeyman. Boy, the boogeyman coming. <laughs> so, on a lighter note, I can tell you how, looking at all of you, many of you are about the age of the year that I've served. So it means I have to be patient with you. <laughs> and you have to understand with it. All right, all right. So, the conference is that question? No, but what happened in the jail to you? No, but the fact is, given the mission statement, we put it up and given to you. You know what I'm saying? I think the defense, the defense, the PR also have given out that statement. Yes, you will put any statement that you have and given to you. You know what I'm saying? I told you the last point of the defense is so you can sit okay, and so you can be calm with. We'll continue with the, the press conference. We'll continue with the press conference. Uh, there was a particular question I was asked, and 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 I and my colleague Minister Westworth of Maine said this one is a crooked question. Whether or not the minister will still command the trust of the friends. The short answer is that the war is in the court of his friends. Was somebody heard? And publicly show remorse, the owners show you to forgive them and give them your trust. So you will not speak on your friends. Again, these are simple issues. If I want to go wrong with you and I got to use that sorry, it's in your conscience to forgive me and give me back your trust. 
So, we'll give you clarity on the question that they now uh, respectfully invite to the podium for presentation. The Deputy Minister of Health and the Minister of Health, Madam Yazulia, will do a presentation giving us uh, the plan. Uh, the plan, uh, you know. Uh, Yes, the, the health financing plan of Liberia. And so, Madam Zoya will do a presentation on the health financing plan of Liberia. And you know, Madam Zoya is also a towering intellectual, very eloquent woman. I'm proud of her, Madam Minister. <laughs> okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. For us to be able to engage in and to on uh, some of the developments in the health sector. Uh, today I will be doing a presentation on the proposed health financing mechanism for Liberia. Now, in 2011, we developed a health financing policy and plan, and in that policy and plan, we had a big vision for finding uh, alternative means to finance healthcare in Liberia in a sustainable way and in a way that will protect the citizens from uh, spending very, very high out of pocket money on a healthcare needs. And so this presentation today is part of the efforts we have been making in the sector to be able to brainstorm on some of the alternative mechanisms that we as a country can explore in order to find ourselves here in that Next. The presentation is in the following order. We will first begin by telling the Liberian people what we've done with the funds or the resources we have been given in the sector, what are some of the accomplishments, and then we will look at the global current uh, investment in health and narrow in on Liberia a specific situation. And then we will also begin a, a preliminary discussion on the need for universal health coverage in the national health insurance scheme. And uh, what are some of the in-country analysis we have done in uh, following of financing health care in Liberia and the way forward. In terms of accomplishments, uh, when we talk over some six years ago, we inherited a broken health system. Most of the facilities were not uh, functioning. Access to healthcare at the time was around 41%. That is, the number of persons that had access within 5 to 10 kilometers of a functional health facility, it was around 41%. Today, uh, statistics that we have gathered from all of the countries and all of the facilities in Europe has shown that access has increased as a result of our various construction and rehabilitation of health facilities. So the graph you see there is across the 15 counties of Europe, what is the current status of access to health facility within 5 kilometers of the facility? or within one hour walk of the facility. So nationally, from 41%, we are now at 71% nationally. So it means that 71% of our population has access to a health facility within five kilometers radius or within one hour walk. Of course, there are disparities or differences when it comes to access within counties, as you can see there, for instance, Babalu County has the lowest access and Montserrat County has the highest access. So in terms of allocating monies for facility construction, whenever we have money in the sector to construct facility, we go to this map and each of the counties have their 10-year plan. They know where the needs are to construct facilities. So whenever we have money to construct just go to the counties that have the least access to private land. Next. Now, when 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 you are you are you are delivering service in the health sector, 
you look at the outcomes. There are a lot of inputs that go into the sector, but the ultimate you are achieving, I mean, you are aiming at is what is the outcome as a result of all of the, the resources that you're putting in the drugs, the human resources, etc. So currently, we have few uh, uh, um, outcome indicators that we want to point to. For instance, when it comes to scale birth attendance, the 10,000 population ratio, we were around 4% in 2006. Currently, we are around 6.78 data. 6.78 is actually, I mean, is data for 2012. This year, in October, we will be having a major health review conference, and we have targets per year for each of these indicators, and we'll be reporting to our partners where we are currently. So the statistics we are seeing there is for 2011, 2012. We have also managed to reduce malaria prevalence. As you all know, malaria is the number one killer disease in Latin Europe, the major cause of hospital cases in the country. From 2006 to 2012, we have managed to reduce malaria prevalence from 66% to 28%. That is more than half uh, a reduction. We have also managed in the sector to reduce major outbreaks of diseases such as cholera, diarrhea, measles, polio, etc. We have increased ART, this is the antiretroviral therapy that HIV and AIDS patients take to enhance their, their living. We have increased uh, the uptake of that from 2,500 patients to close to 5,500 patients. HIV prevalence in Pregnant women is being monitored at the antenatal clinic level because the only visible and convincing sign that somebody is engaged in sexual activity is pregnancy. So that's why we, we, we use pregnant, pregnant women to follow up on the prevalence of HIV. Our antenatal care uh, data for pregnant women shows that we have, we have reduced prevalence of HIV among pregnant women from 5.6 in 2006 to 2.6 in 2011. The delivery system of our skilled birth attendant has also increased from 14% in 2009 to 41% in 2012. Next. <coughs> what is the impact? Maternal mortality is steadily reducing. From 994, now we are at 770, where the DHS report will be coming up hopefully in uh, next October. And we are hoping that the, the, the rates will even be reduced more than the 770 we have seen there. Infant mortality rate or under 5 mortality rate is rapidly reducing. Okay? And the next slide will give you the, the, the confirmation of that. Next. The graph you see in the next slide. Next, next. This graph you see is a statistic that was pulled from 46 African countries. This measures the number of countries. Each of those countries was the MGG group. MGG group has to do with production of under five mortality. Now, the countries that are at the bottom, they are green. The countries that are at the bottom are the countries that are on track to achieve MGG group. And as you can see there, that Libra is leading among all of the countries that are leading, that Libra is leading when it comes to making progress towards reduction of under five mortality. That is the Next. Next. Now, now with all of the successes and the progress we have made, we use resources both from government and from donors to be able to achieve that. The landscape of resources available for health worldwide is becoming worrisome. The graph there you see shows the aid available for health globally. It has been increasing until 2012 when it plateaued or it peaked. And the instances or the indications are that it will gradually begin to decline. So the number of, the amount of money that is available for countries to compete for in terms of aid for health 
you know, will be decreasing, and so the competition will be intensified. Now, it means that there will be uncertainty when it comes to getting money to fund health care in terms of aid because of the continual global economic difficulties. Next. That's the reality. Now, we support countries in the ECOWAS region in terms of donor dependency. We already said that yeah, because of the economic situation globally, you know, the amount of money that will be available will be declining. Now, in Liberia, we are amongst the ex-Cacoas countries that we support, we are the most donor dependent country. The bars, the graph you see there shows resources that come in from governments and from donors. The darker bars show the money that comes from donors. And then the light of bars on top shows the money that comes in from the government. Our statistics show that among all of these countries samples, that there is the most donor dependent. What does that mean? It means that because of our heavy reliance on external aid, we are overwhelmingly vulnerable to any change in the global economic environment. Whenever there is no much money in the global uh, economic environment to fund our health care, it means that we will be vulnerable. You know, we will, be, we will not be unstable. So the funding for health is unpredictable because of the heavy reliance on the government. Next. Now, despite the fact that we are heavily donor dependent, we still are spending less than most ECOWAS countries when it comes to per capita expenditure on health. Currently, we are spending $37 per person on health in like Europe. The average recommended by the WHO is $54, and in ECOWAS region, the average is $51. So compared to the ECOWAS average and to the WHO recommendation, we are still spending low on health in like Europe. Next. Now, all of what I've just stated can be summarized as follows, and these are the issues that are, uh, I mean, critical when it comes to financing health in Africa. We are highly to not dependent. The financing for health is unpredictable. But capital expenditure for health in Africa is below average. We have a landscape of unsustainable financing. It means that we pay for other people more than our own government for financing health. The out-of-pocket spending, the money that people spend out of their, their pocket for their health care is high. And then there is a growing reality of inequity in the health service. Now, what does that mean? We did a benefit incidence, incidence analysis in 2010. And this uh, study shows that the subsidy is the money that the government is giving for health care in Africa. The, the people who benefit from that money most are the wealthy because the hospitals, the health centers, they are located in urban areas where you have people who can afford to attend those services. For the poor Liberians, the poor people in the rural areas are able to access these services. And so because we spend too much money in the hospitals and the health centers, they are benefiting people who have more than the people who are poor. It means that we need to really look at our poor, poor policy because the poor people are tending not to benefit too much from the resources we are putting into the sector. We also, go back, we also see that there is a need to make efficient use of what we have currently, what we are receiving. In addition, we need to build sustainable local national institutions in terms of financing health if we are to take care of the health needs of that Next. Next. Now, in the midst of all of what we have said, globally there is this drive now for universal health coverage. Now, universal health coverage is a human right. It is defined as equitable access to all essential health services for everyone at affordable prices. People do not need to pay a solid for their health care. The health care 
Fortunes you need to ensure that health care is affordable for their citizens. What are the benefits or what are the advantages of universal health coverage? It means that it will protect the population from catastrophic out of pocket payments. Because when you pay too much money for your health care, it will continue, especially when you are poor, you will continue to remain poor. It also has an advantage in that every laboratory will be entitled to the same access and the same level of care no matter where you are. Now, in order to do that, it will require money. And our preliminary in country analysis show that we need to be spending at $61 per person if we are to get universal health care coverage for that. Next. The president attended a meeting uh, in May this year, the 63rd World Health Assembly, and she made this profound statement that people should not have to die simply because they are poor. She expressed her desire to find mechanisms that would allow that person to access health care that they need without having to pay up from police. She recognized that free health care is not free because someone must pay for it. Now, therefore, we believe in the sector that we need to find reliable and sustainable domestic sources of financing that we can use efficiently and equitably through a harmonized purchasing arrangement as has been called for by the National Health Plan. It is with this thinking in mind that the introduction of the health insurance system is being studied in the sector. Next. Now, as I have already said, the $37 is already very low. $54 is the recommendation, and our eight country analysis of our health plan shows that we'll be needing around $61 per person. So it means that we need to begin to think about alternative means of increasing the domestic revenue for health. Next. Next. Now, when you spend more on health, or when you increase the capital spending for health, there are uh, uh, reports or results or studies that show that there are benefits or there are direct correlation with improving the health outcomes. There are several countries who are spending on health, who have high per capita expenditure on health, and there is a direct correlation between spending wise and not efficient and not wasteful spending, but wise spending on health and health outcomes in terms of reducing under five mortality and maternal mortality. Next. Now, in country, there are several sources that we have we are exploring where we could generate uh, revenue for universal health coverage. For instance, the corporate social responsibility, the tax from uh, NGO for social security, uh, payment of premiums, you know, by people who are employed and even the non poor in the informal sector. We're looking at payroll taxes, we're looking at sin taxes, and we have a red on sin taxes later on. We're looking at air and living, and any taxes from the new consumers who have accident in the health sector that bear the burden of taking care of those casualties. So we're looking in all of these directions in order to increase the domestic revenue for health care. Next. Now, like I said previously, we need to build sustainable institutions nationally that will be able to take care of the health care need. We are thinking of this scheme of national health insurance. There are several uh, 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 options for how the money should be pooled. We are proposing a single pool fund or a less fragmented system. In a single pool fund, for instance, you will have your monies that come in from the government, you have monies that come in from the premiums, and the premiums will be from the formal sector, those who are employed, and even the non-poor informal sector. Okay? And then you have the earmark, uh, same taxes and other taxes that we talked about, monies from the water lateral donors, from the bilateral donors, all pulled into this single health insurance fund. Now, what are the advantages when you have this kind of uh, 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 fund pooling uh, mechanisms? First, it will help to improve your efficiency. Efficiency means that instead of us paying now for inputs, we will be paying for outputs, we will be paying for performance, we will be paying providers, healthcare providers for meeting certain targets. 
That will create competition so that people will begin to improve their performance because they want to get paid for that performance. It will help to improve the health system. It will help to ensure quality of care. What will that do when, to solve the problem of equity? In that system, there will be some people who are unable to pay the premium, some people who are very, very poor, who cannot pay. So in the, in the, in the system, those who cannot pay or those who are unable to pay will be paid for through these earmark uh, taxes that we're talking about. So in the system, you will be creating efficiency at the same time ensuring equity. So this is what we are proposing and we are studying uh, the feasibility of this kind of scheme for that growth. Next. Next. Now, like I said, we've been doing some in-country analysis to see where we can pull these kind of funds from. The simple example, the first example is the alcohol and tobacco, which are the same taxes that I just mentioned. Now, you may agree with me that when it comes to bearing the burden of costs for diseases that come about as a result of consuming alcohol and tobacco, it is the health sector that bears the responsibility. So it is logical in order for us to offset some of the, the, the burden that we bear in the cost for these diseases, for the money, for the taxes on these uh, commodities to come in the health sector so that it will help us to increase the financing for health. We did a preliminary cost analysis and it shows that when we, we apply simple uh, uh, mathematics on the current tax, we'll be able to raise between 10 to 30 million just from tobacco and alcohol taxes for the health sector. Next. Now, we did not, in the simulation we just did, we did not include the possibility or the potential for increasing the taxes on these commodities. Already in that we, we, we are paying lower, or we are, we, are, we, are, we are charging lower on the retail price for the cigarettes compared to most countries in the Equus region. We also are charging lower when it compares to the, the tax globally, we are charging lower. So you all will already have a potential there to increase the, 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 the retail price and the tax on these commodities to discourage their use and thereby maybe channel the funds to the health sector. Next. When it comes to airline living, we also did uh, some uh, simulation and we, uh, we know that we can raise between 5 million to 10 million just from airline tax alone. And there are countries in the sub region that are implementing this. Mali, for example, like Niger, for example, is implementing that. And you need a get most of their funding from airline living. Next. In the interim, the health insurance scheme we're talking about is a long term dream. It's a long term. Uh, uh, a scheme that, we, that needs proper planning. But in the interim, some of these taxes we're talking about, we could earmark them for specific diseases. And we know malaria, for instance, is the number one killer disease in Africa. And malaria funding alone, about 79% of that the cost for malaria care is, 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 is donor money. So in order for us to be able to offset some of those uh, 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 spending, we can target or we can earmark some of the tax money to certain commodities for malaria. Say maybe the, the rapid diagnosis testing case that we use, the government can decide to we'll use that tax money to be able to fund this other commodity. In that way, gradually, you'll be moving towards sustainability instead of the over-reliance on promotion. Next. Next slide. So what is the way forward? The, the presentation we just made is the starting point for national discussion. A lot needs to be done before the decision can be made. And above all, the financial figures need to be simulated from all the potential sources. So we just simulated from two potential sources. We have several sources that we need to simulate from and present a comprehensive picture of the day. All of these potential sources, when we simulate from them, are the amount of revenue 
that will be able to generate for the sector and then we will engage relevant authorities, Ministry of Finance and other arrangements, legislature to be able to ensure that the money that we are talking about can be targeted to the local sector. Of course, it will require a lot, a lot of of kingdom not having to be able to do more meetings about the society, the population to engage in this aspect of the because the issue of the industrial problems and the issue of protecting people when they are sick is very, very key. It is a human rights issue, and we need to look at it as a nation moving forward. Last slide. So these are the steps that we, we, we will go through. We did a presentation at Cabinet, and we are presenting today to the Liberian people to engage in the discussion. We will be working in-house, like I said, to do all of the calculations, all of the analysis that are necessary, draft all of the bills that are necessary, uh, submit to legislature, and once it has been approved, then we are hoping that effective fiscal year 2014, 2015, we can begin actual implementation of even the immediate uh, phase that we talked about here. So this is open for discussion, and I mean, it is the ministry's thinking, and we take responsibility for ensuring that we plan for health financing in Liberia. We know that the landscape does not look good, and, and so because of that, we as planners have begun, you know, uh, uh, in our own discussions in house to see how best we can find alternative sustainable financing for healthcare in Liberia. So the discussion is now open. I mean, whatever uh, uh, contributions you know you have to make, whatever the thinking is like in the public, we really want to engage the public because we want to move forward with this initiative. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. This is Ia Enzolia, the Minister of Planning, Research and Development, Minister of Health and Social Welfare. We go back to the Bizarre Officer and then we'll come back from there. Again, we want to thank Madam Enzolia. At this stage, we'll allow Madam Enzolia to catch a break and we'll take a glass of water. So, at this stage, we will now. Ask the director of public affairs and the party to moderate this session. The line of question will be directed to uh, the director general of the civil service agency, uh, Mr. George. Thank you very much, Deputy Mr. Jackson. We want to take your questions. We will begin with. Mr. George Kiwana, Director General, Civil Service Agency. Thank you. Please have any questions for Mr. Kiwana? Okay. Mr. Kiwana was in the street of fun and our rights were due to you. You said that compensation in the public sector is unfair and unjust. Uh, Given that, what are you doing, I, along with other uh, agency, the relevant agency, to ensure that people are justly paid? For example, we have this Liberian data, and we have the United States data, I mean, the SP, what they call SP. How are you trying to harmonize uh, such things so that people are justly paid and the qualification and the, the responsibility that's there? So, do we have any questions? It's a long question, right? Okay. Oh, Peter, thank you for the question in the first place. Um, there are several moving pieces here. Um, it's easy to come up to say, let people get paid this. But remember, there are some challenges we need to resolve before that. You have to resolve the issue of too many people on payroll who should not be there. And these people on payroll who should not be there are costing government a lot of money. And if we were to identify them, as we are doing now, 
and to take them on payroll, we will use the savings to increase the pay of those who are actually working. And that's what we're working on. As a country, we have a tradition with the U.S. dollar. We also have a dollar right now. So we we have to make a decision in terms of whether or not we want to pay people in the Liberian dollar or we want to pay in the U.S. dollar or pay in both. There are there some companies that have said that it would be something good to pay people, say, 60% in the Liberian dollar and 40% in the U.S. dollar. Those decisions have to be made. But it's a good question you ask, but there are issues that must be resolved. The payroll must be looked at who is on it, why are they on it, do they need to be on it. When those decisions are made, then you can look to rationalizing pay and then increasing professionally the pay of those who are actually working in government. There's another element to this. We have to, as I said earlier, we have to put in place a grading system, steps, that when you have a job today, you can look up to pay increments without calling regular stations. You have to evaluate people's performance. And on the basis of performance evaluations, people get pay increments. You don't just call radio stations, threaten strikes, and go into the legislature, and because you think your constituents must be less than a scholar in the difference. I personally discovered that if you are a professional, I should argue because you have something afterwards. And you did the job, job, when you wish, 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 that should be an argument going forward, not just a formal call to a radio station. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wang. You will follow up? Yeah, follow up. Did you just No, 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 no. You said since 2006, the government has fully educated our four resources. All right. But the issue is is there a way that the CSA is tracking? All of the, all of those processes of trees because those are the the whole process of the team making two different agreement agreement government agreement government yes 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 what I mean what is the what is the process of tracking should be by the one government by one government thank you um uh oh. Uh, that's a good question. The, uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, the, the number is, of giving you, uh, the number of giving from you a small program is from a small program, is from a small program that right now that is management of a team on a serious team. And that team. program has a lot of that program. If you know, what I do suspect is that since 2006, that many Syrians, Syrians if any civic government ministry, civic government ministry is giving scholarships, so the number of scholarships, so the number of people are far more important. This program has been about just this program has been about just about which is a tracking, and which is a tracking since 2010. The cabinet endorsed the cabinet endorsed so all that policy they had a record of those who those who have been given this have a record of the government government, and when they come back. They must serve the government for at least two years before they can benefit from any other scholarship. Now, as to whether they work in government or the private sector, my feeling is this. We want government to be strong enough to do what it has to do. But government alone will not absorb every librarian that comes back from the scholarship themselves. So we need to grow the private sector so that it can also absorb the students that are coming back. And since many of you are young, when you are choosing a scholarship, be careful. Analyze the private sector in terms of what it needs. So that when you come back, you can easily, more easily find a job with somebody, for example, who may be continuing to get a scholarship that is the same liberal arts that we offer in Liberia. I'm not looking down on liberal arts. What I'm saying is our skills gaps are in the sciences, engineers, doctors, plumbers, 
carpenters, professionals you can call to do a piece of job. We have investments that are beginning to pick up. And we need technically trained librarians to put in positions that we don't have to go to Ghana for. We need people who can help us fix our photocopiers. You have so many photocopiers lying in. We need people who can fix computers. Or we do this one that we can follow us on the game. And there are brand new computers that have a single problem. We need to bring somebody from Ghana. So we need librarians, young librarians, to start thinking in terms of these kind of skills gaps and these kinds of hard to study disciplines so that we can place them easily to contribute to the economy. Thank you very much. We want to move on Mark the same before Mom and Sonia. The Mutual Health situation. Then the Minister of the Planet Research and Development. Do we have questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Madam Minister, Daniel Davis. Some year back, the government of France uh, allotted five or five million dollars to the government of the Bureau to the health ministry. And the health ministry is like this program and area for the usage of the money. I want to know where area of the money has been touched in life of the government with internal health. Thank you. She will go to the question. Just come forward. I'm not sure if you need to have a full question. I'm not sure if you need to come to me. I'm not sure if you need to be encouraged to take questions and then come. The question is important also. What is my question has to do with the allocation of tax revenue from alcohol and tobacco? Now, it's in very, I mean, if you find it, you're going to generate 10 to 30 million from these uh, institutions. Uh, I believe the institutional consent is to make profits. And we have the law that the government has been approved when it comes to public smoking. Don't you think you should encourage the lawmaker to bend the institution for manufacturing more cigarettes to pollute the streets than to encourage people to get taxes? From them because we only very well that their percentage is the maximum percentage. And the next question is uh, on the in the graph display, library is commentary in the blue position in, in the green zone as described by you, which is very perfect. Now we got the alarming system of of uh, we got the alarming system of uh, health worker calling for increase. Yeah, salary demonstration have been all over the country. Hey, well, don't try to think we'll quit the opposition. So how do you compromise this? Thank you. We'll take the final question from this one. Please discuss on The Honorable Minister, you mentioned in your opening statement that uh, 71% of the country population have access to health facilities within the five kilometer radius or within one hour time. You care to follow the library or we shut up the country that causes this sort of embassy. We are not bound on the end of this. Madam Sonia, Okay, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, somebody asked about the French donation. Uh, in the initial account, we have something we call a pool fund. And this pool fund is actually a mechanism, a fund harmonization mechanism that the initial account put in place to reduce the fragmentation of donor funding that come into the country. So most of the money that you hear about, they come into this pool fund, and the pool fund is used to finance service delivery to most of the counties, currently we are covering a good proportion of the counties when it comes to money that are put into the pool fund. So whether French donation or money from Irish aid or money from DFA, we put them in the pool fund and then we have uh, NGOs uh, who compete for the funds to be able to uh, deliver healthcare services for us in the country. So that's how the money is used. Most of the money do not target specific interventions. In some instances, they do, 
for instance, of instances is done. For instance, the USAID units we spend it on three counties in Agrodofa, Bong, and Neba. So for these ones, you be specific to see this where the money is going. But for money that we pour into the pool fund, the NGOs become the right proposals and we use the money to be able to deliver health care in uh, most of the counties. Now, you asked a question on the rationale for using same taxes instead of just banning uh, 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 smoking. Well, we have made some efforts at least with uh, one large within the power of the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare. That is to ban public smoking. Okay? But um, these are habits, things that alcohol consumption and tobacco smoking. We wish we could do it. <laughs> we wish we could do it, but I mean, if somebody decides they want to drink, is that not the person's right to drink? You know? I mean, is it in the purview of the Ministry of Health to tell people don't drink if you drink, it will just be resting or something? I mean, I don't think uh, that's the route we want to go. However, what we are saying is we are not trying to encourage people to drink or to smoke as a result of uh, allocating some of the tax money to help smoke. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that since people are drinking anyway, since they're smoking anyway, when we put these kind of conditions there, it will discourage the smoking, it will discourage the drinking. And furthermore, because it is the sector that bears the greatest burden of taking care of the cancer and the diseases that result when people smoke, when people drink, it is only logical to allocate some of that money to the sector. That is what we are saying. Okay? And then somebody asked, currently we are reducing uh, infant or under five mortality and yet health workers are um, on strike for increased um, salaries. I don't see the connection. But what I, what I know is that currently there are work going on behind the scenes to be able to address the issue of uh, compensation for the health workers. Is the health workers uh, hard work that has helped us to reach where we are. We want to sustain those things. We want them to continue to perform. We want them to continue to render the services they are uh, rendering. And we want them to do it under a uh, good uh, uh, environment, you know, and we want them to get the necessary incentives, you know, to be able to perform, to motivate them to perform. And I think there's a committee that was set up to work on all of the issues that the health workers have. about the access issue the activities around 71 percent uh, that we should elaborate on them. The figure we are giving you the 71 percent it shows around the country the proportion of Liberians that have a facility within five kilometers radius or within one hour walk. We did that for all of the counties, and I think I showed the graph to you. For each county, there's a proportion, there's a percentage there. And I told you that Bapolu County has the lowest access. It means that in Bapolu County, for instance, 32% of the population in Bapolu has access within five kilometers.
and I'm analyzing what to avoid what to have a access access button to be able to be able to determine that in in I guess I guess uh, uh, so I have to I to I have 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 to I it's a final question. It's a final question. There is a from from Okay, thank you very much. Um, the issue of access, um, the issue of access, uh, I think uh, we have, I think uh, we have to do it. When we see in the message out there, in the message out there, yeah, coffee smoking wrong is. Then maybe we will begin. Then maybe we will begin to think about the purely good sweat, purely good sweat, okay, boy. And you know, purely all of these things. And you know, purely so all the first stage is yes, when the public uh, show more cars, the north stage is yes, so when the public uh, people come in the public or show more cars. The love of now that is born goes to help with good sweat. The love of now is born for good. And then the issue, and then the, the issue regarding uh, the this things, remember I told you that Montreal has very close to 95% so access. So it means that a state is small proportions now, I did not share much, rather, had 100% action. I said he had 45% action. We record that if you grew up much, rather, the challenges are very, very hard. And this is one reason why each of the countries, when you go down to the challenges, it will show you a map. Of Montreal County in the total area of that map where the city is being constructed. And as the funds become available, it will be able to assist us in the city of 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 we had a little bit of a few We were so hard to do this to try to find that we had a little bit of a few and ambulance. We know it's a challenge, and uh, whenever the resources are available, we, uh, we will make the next everyone. The last question has to do with uh, the issue of curative versus preventive care. The interventions in the ministry are both curative and preventive, and we tend to lean more, we want to lean more on preventive. 
uh, the immunization, for instance, that we do, the, the family planning, and the malaria, all malaria control, all of those are prepared. Now you talked about the breeding of the mosquitoes and all of that. In the malaria uh, control program, we have several methods that we're using to prevent malaria. We are tackling the parasites, we are tackling the mosquitoes that carry the parasites. In terms of tackling the mosquitoes, we have uh, the mosquitoes that are also used to use the specific models that are being prevented, it creates a barrier between you and the mosquito. We also, you may want to know that we also are doing indoor residual spray. When we did our malaria survey, we realized that there are certain areas in the country where the prevalence is high compared to other areas. And so we mapped out that area, and currently we are doing spraying and things in those regions. Now, it is very, very interesting that most people think that whenever you have a lot of mosquitoes, therefore you will have malaria. Statistics and studies in Liberia shows that Monrovia has the lowest prevalence of malaria. Although Monrovia has the highest concentration of mosquitoes, but it has the lowest prevalence of malaria. And you know the reason? Not every mosquito that you see is a malaria carrying mosquito. Not every mosquito is a malaria carrying mosquito. Some of the mosquitoes transmit yellow fever. Some of them transmit um, the elephantiasis, the disease that causes elephantiasis, the parasites that causes that. Some of the mosquitoes transmit that. The killers mosquitoes, for instance, they breathe in the dirty water, in the, in, the, in the toilets, and all of that. And then there are some mosquitoes, they black and white, they bite you when you're sitting out those green evening time. Those ones transmit yellow fever. The, mon the mosquitoes that transmit malaria, we have studied their habits, and it is based on their habits that the interventions that we are deploying are being used. They bite and rest in peace at night. So when you are sleeping, you sleep under your mosquito nest, you will be able to, to reduce that. And it is because of some of the, the various intervention mechanisms that we have put in place that we have been able to reduce the prevalence from 66 to 28 percent. You, you don't, uh, malaria intervention that we carry on are based on international best practices. So you don't just go around spraying everywhere because people feel that mosquitoes is breathing everywhere. And by the way, mosquitoes breathe in clean water. The anophilus mosquito that transmits malaria, it breathes in clean running water. So as soon as it rains, for instance, the water that sits in the pond, leaves in the, in around the house, in the small ponds, those clean water, they are the ones that they are not feeling this breathing. They are just breathing dirty water. The mosquitoes that breathe dirty water are the ones that transmit all the diseases all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Sonia. Thank you, Madam Sonia. And we also know the Lord debate and qualifying credentials. So I'd like to thank our distinguished speaker. I would like to now ask the Deputy Minister of Administration, Mr. Laura Stewart, to do our official pool of thanks. Yeah, it's a pool of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jackson, and I mean on behalf of our Minister of Policy, Brown, the Sacrum, and all the Deputy Ministers and Assistant Ministers here, as well as the staff, and the key presenters at this press conference today, uh, beginning with the Minister of Defense, Peter Samakai, who presented very well, touching on various national issues as well as I uh, had the opportunity to address very compassionately an issue concerning the uh, uh, the recording. Following that uh, we had the opportunity to hear from George Wyman, the Director General 
of the civil service nature so that everybody employees or by employees that may who are on payroll are part of the civil service and we applaud the efforts towards reforming the agency Mr. Director General and I can assure you that our ministry will collaborate with your institution in implementing some of those reforms that are designed to elevate the level of competence and efficiency in many of our ministry agencies. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and share with us some of the things that we've done. Thank you, Ms. Madam Zonia. Again, I, this is your second time to appear in here at our press conference, and certainly you are often for a great show with the presentation and with your, 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 your presentation, your style, your eloquence, your ability to charm and impress, but at the same time to portray what the Ministry of Health is doing to us, making sure that we reduce our infant mortality and other five mortality rates, as well as we reduce the high prevalence of the malaria infection or disease. Um, again, the innovation that the Ministry of Health is now trying to bring to bear on our health sector uh, is the National Health Insurance Fund. We think it's, it's liable and we want to do uh, to make sure we get the word out there about some of these things. Our job here at the Ministry, at the minimum, is to provide information to the public through you, our media colleagues and practitioners. So we depend on you for information sharing and dissemination. As we often say, you are a critical component to this whole exercise. And we thank you very much for coming every Thursday to participate in this press conference. And we look forward to listening and doing your reports and analysis actualities and headlines uh, beginning today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith.